Proverbs chapter 1, <coughs> and I want to begin reading with verse 20, <coughs> excuse me, we were reading this and came across this verse and was thinking about it and wanted to share some thoughts on it. Proverbs chapter 1, <coughs> beginning with verse 20 through verse 33. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the street, she crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. And I was reading this in verse 22. It says, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. I wasn't sure exactly how to title this or approach this, but I, I settled on the idea of three sinful attitudes. Three sinful attitudes that describes sinners. The simple ones who love simplicity, the scorners who delight in scorning, and the fools who hate knowledge. And so we need to examine these three sinful attitudes and behavior patterns that they describe. The Bible teaches us that out of the heart proceeds the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. That is, put a guard around it uh, with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Out of the heart proceeds all the issues of life. We see in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, in the days of Noah, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Because the imaginations of the heart, we see that man corrupted his way, his, his doings, his, his behavior was corrupt because the imaginations of his heart, out of the heart proceed the issues of of life. And then in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 7, it's 
pages are so thin, I can't tell. I think I've turned one page and I've turned two or three. Mark chapter 7, verse 20. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. They come out of the heart. The heart is the seat of our emotions and will. The Bible referring to the heart, he's not just talk, he's not talking about our physical organ that pumps blood, but as the, the physical heart is to the body. So the core of man, his heart, that is the seat of his will, his mind, his emotions. Is what it is referring to here. And so, and the Bible tells in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It can be seen in our behavior and the displayed attitudes which proceed and come forth out of the heart. And so as we look at these three attitudes and their characteristics, the simple ones, you know, so how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? In doing a word study here, the description of the simple ones <coughs> is someone who is easily allured, enticed, or flattered. You know, there are some people that just, they're easily persuaded by flattery. And someone who is of that turn of mind that somebody says something very flattering, boy, you're just you're ready to believe everything they say. You see, that's that's a simple one. They're simple-minded. That's what it's describing here. I remember my my family teases me. One time when we were had to retrain to do something more sedentary and was looking at some different art schools and things around. We went to this one up in Paul's Ball. And, and I had some samples of my work. Of course, you know what they say, a prophet hath no honor in his own home. Of course, my kids have grown up and have seen me draw all their lives. And so it's no big deal. But this guy was carrying on, was talking about, I had this phenomenal portfolio. And everybody just laughed. They, they knew the guy was flattering. You know. And someone who would be easily persuaded. You know, he says they're simple. You know, going to buy a used car, you, you need to kind of know what you're doing, what you're looking for, because, you know, the, the used car salesman, they'll flatter you, they'll do all sorts of things to sell you a car. So this is the attitude of the simple one, but especially in the context of sin, that we're easily persuaded, we're easily enticed or flattered in such a way as to uh, entice us to sin. And so, and the simple ones, he says, they love simplicity. They love to be flattered. They love to be enticed. Over in, in verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10, he admonishes his son, here my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. In other words, don't be a simple one. 
If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Doesn't make any difference what they say, what arguments they use. Don't listen to it. Don't consent to it. Over in chapter 2 and verse 12, um, it says, To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they froward in their paths to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Proverbs many times here talks about the strange woman, the harlot, and how she entices and flatters uh, with her lips. Uh, they love sin. I believe this is the underlying key here. They love sin. Therefore, they are easily led astray. You know, James talks about a man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. Drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. And, and I pointed out the enticement is something that is outside of us uh, that is seeking to draw us into sin. But there is that within us which is attracted to that. Drawn away of their own lusts and enticed. Uh, Romans 1.32 He said, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So it talks about here the simple ones, easily enticed, seduced, attracted to sin. Uh, the Bible talks about evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So this first one I believe speaks to us concerning the sinner's attitude towards sin. They love it. They delight in it. They desire it. They are the simple ones. Then the second one mentioned here it says and the scorners. A scorner uh, is someone who mocks, makes fun of. And they are characterized by delighting or they derive joy and pleasure by mocking. And I believe the context here is that they, uh, particularly by mocking God, mocking His Word, and those that believe it. The idea of uh, scorning here, they delight in scorning. And it means to have, hold something in derision or to speak uh, disrespectfully uh, uh, against something. And so here again we see this beginning in the heart and manifested in behavior and attitude toward God. Now I believe we see this originally displayed in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 when Satan came to Eve in the garden and he asked the question but it's very cynical, it's very sarcastic I believe. Hath God said? And he goes on and proceeds to cast doubt on the word of God and, and upon them for believing it. He goes, because oh, God knows that uh, if, if you eat of this fruit, you'll become wise and, and you'll be like Him. And so He spoke very critical of God and of God's Word. And the Bible says, You're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. And so we see this critical attitude, this mocking 
attitude toward God and toward His Word. Uh, now, in the New Testament, the, the word scorn and scorners, scorning is something we find all through the Old Testament, especially in the book of Proverbs. It uses this word. The New Testament equivalent, we find one time here, it was in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, he talked about in the last days, scoffers would come. And the word there in the Greek, it is a, the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word, and it means to deride or to mock, to hold something in derision, uh, to, to speak against it uh, in, in a condescending and putting down sort of way, and uh, to mock it. So uh, the word scoffers, and why, where is the promise of His coming? You see, they're, they're mocking God's Word. God has made a promise. He said He's going to come back. He's laid out for us uh, events that are going to take place and what He's going to do in the last days. But these scoffers come along and they make fun of that and those that believe God's Word and they want to question them. You know, did, did God really say that? Is that what He meant? You know, and we hear this, uh, we're surrounded by this all the time. Uh, whether it be in, in school, or the universities, or the news, or, you know, all of these things. You want to see some scoffers. You look at some of these people, what they say about the, the Ark and, and the Creation Museum there in Kentucky. And, and just, how dare they go against science and, and when in reality they're displaying the true understanding of science. And, uh, but oppositions of science falsely so-called. Uh, so you see this mocking, scoffing uh, attitude. They hold the Word of God in contempt. They blaspheme and criticize not only uh, the holy pronouncements of God's Word, uh, but uh, those that believe it as well. Romans 1.8 or excuse me, Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness or ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And the word hold the truth is they suppress, they hold down the truth. As the eye. They want to suppress the truth and they do it in unrighteousness. They, they speak evil of the Word of God and they do so in a very mocking uh, way. And so it sees not only the actions here, the behavior, but the attitude manifested in this behavior. And then finally it says fools. Fools hate knowledge. The word here for fool is just someone who's silly. It is silly. It's characterized by their hatred. That is to hold something as odious. Uh, a word for enemy. There's an enmity uh, here uh, toward knowledge. Now that sounds kind of strange. That there, that knowledge, that a person could be in a state of warfare or enmity uh, toward knowledge, but it's the source of knowledge. It is the truth that they are so opposed to. The hatred of knowledge or the wisdom of God. And there's a number of uh, scriptures that come into mind here when we talk about the fool. Uh, the first verse kind of lays the uh, foundation here in, in Proverbs 1 7. Uh, it talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. 
Uh, here it says the beginning of knowledge. Other places says the beginning of wisdom. We see that wisdom and knowledge are tied to one another. Because it goes on to say fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so uh, here is describing one who has no fear of God, but a strong animosity, a hatred toward wisdom and knowledge. Uh, Psalm 14 Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They, are, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And that is to be understood. So here is describing the, the attitude of the, the fool, first of all, he says there's no God. He is declaring his independence from God. Uh, he's declaring that God cannot hold him accountable, that there will be no judgment. So he acts according to that belief that there is no God. And he says he does abominable works. We see in Romans 3.18, he describes them, and this is uh, actually quoting from uh, Psalm 14. Because um, as we read on here, they, they have done abominable works. Uh, there is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God there all gone aside, they're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That is what Paul is quoting uh, then Romans chapter 3 verse 10. It says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Why? Because he said, already said in his heart, there is no God. There's no reason for me to fear God. There is no judgment. There is no hell. There is, you know, they deny that accountability and the judgment of God. They deny uh, that there is such a thing as sin. And so... <coughs> There is nothing to fear, and therefore they do whatever they please to do. They do abominable things. Uh, one of the scriptures we see here, they reject the revelation of God has given of Himself and prefer to substitute their own reasoning. In Romans chapter 1, Verse 21 and 22 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves to be wise. So if, uh, here a man sets himself up as the source and the pinnacle of wisdom and knowledge. He excludes God from those things. 
He is a fool. <coughs> the fool has said no God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools because their foolish heart was darkened. As I said, there's many other things then in Proverbs, and it speaks a lot about the fool and describes the fool. So these three characterizations of sin in the center of the sinful attitude of man, the simple, the scorning, the scorners, and the fools. They love sin. They delight in mocking God. And they hate the Word of God. God's revealed Word. And that includes His reproof, His rebuke, His instruction, righteousness. What is it that Paul in talking to Timothy and describing the Scriptures, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for uh, doctrine, for uh, reproof, rebuke, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so, but they do not want the instruction. They do not want the correction. They do not want the reproof. Uh, that is why it says the fools hate knowledge. He says, uh, so I've called and you refused. I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded. You've said it, not all my counsel and with none of my reproof. We see the error of this attitude. You know, for a time, the simple, the scorner, the fool, appear, at least in their own mind, in their own eyes, they are right. And they appear to be in control. They appear to be on top. But we need to understand that we be not intimidated that we be not discouraged, that we fret not ourselves because of evildoers, nor should we be tempted to copy their ways. Because in the end, and eventually, their error will be manifested when they are rewarded for their sin and their error. As we read here verse 24 through 27, we read part of this. He says, Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. So it will come. You know, for a time they appear to be successful. They appear to be on top. The, uh, they have the control. They have the success. They have the power. But judgment is coming. And it's not just talking about the judgment after death. There, there is that too. But here he says, uh, When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. He said, that's coming. And when it does, then suddenly... Things turn around, you know. They're no longer in control. 
as one of the things I, I've thought about, and I've shared this thought before, but when I was with the, the fire department, there was a young man, and I don't remember his name, who it was at this time, but I remember one of the young men, because I was the chaplain, and uh, but I think he made a, a comment, well, I, I'm the captain of my own destiny. You know, and that's part of the philosophy that's out there in the world. And, and that's the mindset of the simple, the scorner, and the, the fool. I am in charge of my life. I make the decisions for my life. I'll determine for myself what I'm going to do. But there are so many things that are outside the individual's control that they have absolutely no power over that can impact and influence and change all their plans. Can make all their planning and all their thinking just poof, go away. That's when it hits home. They are not the captain of their own destiny. They are not in charge of their own life. There are powers that be that we have no control over that will influence and impact us. And that's what God is describing. When your fear cometh, your, uh, when destruction cometh, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. When things just, when they don't work out like you had planned. This is the reward of the wicked in this life. Death and then the judgment. As Hebrews says, it's appointed that man wants to die, and after this, the judgment as well. Now, I've heard the saying that there are no atheists in the foxhole. And talking about, you know, in, in combat and war and, and the foxhole, and the shells are landing a, a, around you, and the bullets are flying overhead, even the most avowed atheist begins to call out to God for help. And we see that of, of the simple, the scorners, the fools, that when their calamity comes, when their distress and anguish comes, what does it say? They will call upon me. You know, when I call to them, they wouldn't listen. When I called to them, they didn't want any part of it. And now the distress and all has come upon them, the anguish has come upon them, and they're wanting to call out to me for help. He said, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they shall not find me. He is not going to be available for them. And that, that's such a sad thing. And, and because, and part of this is because of their attitude that once they're delivered out of their problem, they go right back to uh, scorning. They go right back to mocking. They go right back to being fools. They go right back to being simple. Nothing has really changed. And God knows that. He says, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. So because of that attitude that is displayed here by the simple, by the scorners, by the fools, <clears throat> God says, He's not going to hear. He's not going to be available for them in their time of distress and anguish. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple, that is because they were so easily enticed and led astray, that's the very thing, he says, that will slay them. The very things that they delighted in, that they followed, they were easily enticed and allured by, those will be the things eventually that will bring their anguish and distress upon them. 
You know, God warns them, and they would not of any of his reproof. You know, as like that children, you know, when, when parents or teachers correct them, or other adults may correct them, then they don't want to listen, and they want to, they're, want to be stubborn, they want to, you know, be headstrong, they want to do it their way, and no matter what, they don't want reproof, they don't want correction. Better be careful. And sometimes the kids get to run with friends and the parents see that may not be the best influence on them. They warn their children, don't, don't want you running with so-and-so. The children sneak off and run with them anyway. But then when so-and-so entices them into stealing a car or doing drugs or doing something like that and they get arrested, then they want mom and dad to come bail them out. And the same thing with God. You know, God warns us that don't do that. We don't want His instruction. We don't want His reproof. We don't want His correction. And we do our own thing. And the very things that we do ultimately brings the very distress and anguish and destruction upon us. And we begin to cry out to Him, come bail me out. They shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. What is it? He said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. You scorners, those who would mock God and mock the Word of God and those that believe the Word of God. You really believe that? You really believe in a six-day creation that God created everything in six days? You really believe that Jesus came and He died for your sins? Mocking and making fun of God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. You know, you sow to the flesh, and the flesh will reap destruction. That's what he says. So their own devices, the fruit, the results of their own choices and behavior. However, we see that in all of this and in these warnings, God extends the scepter of mercy and grace to those who will hear. Those who will hear. Verse 23, you know, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. We see verse 33, But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Whoso hearkeneth unto me. We saw in verse 20, the beginning, wisdom cried out. And what he's referring to, uh, wisdom is personified here as the woman uh, and, and she's crying out and she's everywhere. The Word of God, God in, in the creation, the creation itself, the heavens declare His handiwork. Uh, the things, the creation uh, manifests and reveal His eternal power, Godhood and uh, power and Godhood. And so, or Godhead. Almost got it right. Godhead. Eternal power and Godhead. Uh, these things are revealed, and in that wisdom is crying out. The truth, that knowledge, is crying out. It's being manifested. It talks about that there's a language that is known everywhere. As we see the sun following its course, the moon, the stars in their courses in the heaven, they declare His handiwork, and it's a language that is known and understood everywhere throughout the world. Wisdom is crying out. Whenever the Word of God is 
being preached. Every tract that is handed out, every time someone witnesses, that is wisdom crying out. And so he asked the question, how long will you continue in your unbelief? He said, turn you at my reproof. That is, repent. As Jesus said, the king, time has come, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. Time has come. God says, I will pour out my spirit to you. And he'll make his words known to you. You know, it won't be foolishness anymore. I believe Paul, writing to the church there at Corinth, was describing, you know, the Jews seek after the sign. The Greeks seek wisdom uh, to the... The Jews, Jesus Christ, Him crucified, the resurrection is a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. But to those that believe, it's the power of God. It's the wisdom of God. He will make His words known. When the disciples asked Jesus why He taught in parables, He revealed to them, says, Unto you it has been given to know. Now what a profound statement and comment. That to you it has been given to know the power, the ability to receive and understand knowledge. These things are spiritually discerned. You know, he says repent. Repent. And your mind and heart realize I have sinned against God. I have been like what he described. I've been simple. I've been a scorner. I've been foolish. And those that turn away from God and turn a deaf, deaf ear to him are all three of those things. Repent. Turn you at my reproof. And he will pour out his spirit on you. And he will make his words known to you. God would be merciful and gracious to you. Don't refuse him. Three sinful attitudes. The simple, the scorners, and the foolish. All three describe the unrepentant, the unbeliever. And their calamity will come. In this life, as well as death and in judgment in the life to come. Be wise. Adopt a very healthy respect and reverence for God, the fear of God. And take heed to His word. Those that hearken to Him, He will bless. And you'll have peace and safety in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us stand.